Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for our service online. We are thankful for each and every one of you that has decided to worship with us today. We are excited because no matter what is going on around us, we know that our mission, our vision, our purpose as Pin Oaks Christian Fellowship and as believers does not stop, it does not change, right? We still exist to help people meet Jesus and grow in that relationship. And I'm so thankful that we have the opportunity and the ability to do that via these online services. There's a lot of awesome things that are, that are going on right now uh, on our Facebook pages and on our websites, and, and we want you to be a part of that. So there are a couple of ways that you can connect with us. One of them is through our custom church app. If you just simply go to wherever you get your apps from, whether that is on Apple or Android phones, search for Pin Oaks, P-I-N-O-A-K-S, and download our custom church app. That's a great way for you to stay connected with us. You can um, find out more about us, find our home groups, uh, find out about how uh, you can give to our church. All of those things are available on our custom church app. Another great way is through our social medias, through our Facebook pages. If you go to Facebook and search for Pin Oaks Christian Fellowship, you'll find that there. Uh, or you can also search for our Pin Oaks Student Ministry and our Pin Oaks Children's Ministry. There's a lot of great content going on there. There are devotionals, um, daily devotionals that are being put out there, challenging thoughts and scripture verses. Uh, we have uh, our pastor has just started a, a introduction to the Bible Bible study. All of that stuff is available online. We want you to be able to take advantage of it during this time. Right now, if you are with us, right, because like I said, our mission and our vision doesn't stop, it doesn't change. If you are new with us, if you are just connecting with us and joining us in service for the first time, or maybe you've just found us over the last couple of weeks, we would love for you to uh, click on the link that's going down in chat right now. It's being put in there right now and fill out our connection card because we are not going to stop growing. We're not going to stop pursuing after Christ and seeking to help people meet Jesus and grow in that relationship. That continues. And so we wanna help you do that. So if you, would connect, if you would click that link to fill out our online connection card, you can tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, maybe how we can uh, help you along in, in your journey to know Jesus better. And we wanna do that for you today. So click that link and, and go follow those uh, easy steps for us. Uh, we also have an awesome tool on our website uh, that we've just added in the last few weeks that I think is really, really awesome and fantastic. And we have this, this custom prayer wall for our church. And so if you would go to www.pinoaks.org, and if you look on the top part of, of our website, you'll see at the very right side, it says pray. If you click on that, you'll be able to go to our custom prayer wall, and you can see uh, how other people in our church have been asking for prayer. You can post prayer requests, and you can mark that you've prayed for those those things, and a message will get sent to that person that posted their prayer request. But we want to take full advantage of all of these things, because even though we are physically apart, spiritually, we can continue to connect with one another and challenge each other and grow together. So do that for me. One last thing I've got for you guys this morning is that one of the ways we're called to serve our church is through our tithes and offerings. And that continues even today. God calls us to be faithful. He calls us to be generous with our money and our time. And so we would ask that you would continue to be generous. You guys have been amazing and have blown us away so far with your generosity. There are a couple of ways that you can give during this time. One is through that custom church app that I mentioned. If you go all the way down to the bottom, you'll see a, a give button that you can cl click and it'll take you through three or four easy steps to give online. And the other one is through our, cust or our web church website, www.pinoaks.org. Click the give button on the top section of our website and it'll take you through those same easy steps. Two ways to give. Really, really easy, but we're um, so thankful and we're so blessed to see how you guys responded during this time.
excited to share the word with you today. And so that's what I want to start with right as we begin here today. Uh, John chapter, tw- uh, chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. So we're going to jump right in here, and this is what it says. It says, the, the next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they, they took branches of palm trees, and they went out to meet him, and they were crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey, and he sat on it, just as it is written. This is what it said. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. As the disciples didn't understand these things at first, but when, they, uh, but when Jesus had, was glorified, then they remembered these things that had been written about him and had been done to him. It goes on in verse 17. It says, the, the crowd that had been uh, with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. They were continuing to talk about the things that they'd seen. They were continuing to tell the story. Uh, in verse 18, it says, the reason why the, the crowd went to meet him was that they'd heard he had done this sign. And then verse 19, to kind of wrap up this first section, it says, the, the Pharisees said to one another, you see, you see that, that you're gaining nothing. Look, the, the world has gone after him. Uh, you know, as a, as a, it, what taking is, what's taking place in this particular scripture is there's, there's a, a group of people at a tomb and they're gathered together. And it's, uh, it's right outside of Bethany, and it's Jesus, it's Mary, uh, Martha, and then a, and a small gathering of people. And they're gathering because a friend of Jesus, whose name was Lazarus, had died just a few days before. And, and Jesus goes to the tomb, and when he arrives, he gets to the tomb, and he orders, he orders the tomb to be opened. And, and when it's open, he prays for his friend. And then he cries out in the midst of that, Lazarus, come out. Well, suddenly a a linen-clad figure appears at the entrance of the tomb. He's bound from head to toe with with these strips of cloth all around him. Some people run quickly to meet him, and they begin to unbind him, especially on his face. And as as he does that, he realizes the people begin to realize it's it's Lazarus. Right? And and the crowd is stunned. They're, They're literally like in awe of what had taken place. Jesus just raised a man from the dead. So two, two men sprint down the road because they're going to go tell people. They're going to let people know what just put, took place. It, it was a stunning miracle. And, and most of them would have never thought that this would happen in their lifetime. And, and it created a frenzy in Israel. And you could imagine, I mean, how would you react? What would, what would you do in that moment? I know what I would do. I would run and tell the first person I could find. And then again, and again, and again. And that's exactly what these guys were doing. Well, the chief priests and the Pharisees called for an emergency session of the council. These were the religious leaders of the day because they were worried. They were concerned. And this is what it says in in this particular verse. If you you go to John chapter 11, just go back a little bit. It says this. It says the chief priests and the the Pharisees gathered the council and they said, "What, what are we going to do for this man performs many signs? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And and the Romans will will come and, and take away both our place and our nation. They're worried about their power, right? But then one of them, Caiaphas, who, who was the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you even understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and, and not for the nation only, but also to gather uh, into one of the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they, they made plans to put him to death. That's part of the reason why these religious leaders were so nervous. Part of the reason why they were gathering and making plans was because it was, it was the time of Passover. And, and at first, that may not seem like a big deal, but this was one of three annual festivals that were massive for Jewish people. They gathered tons and tons of people together, and, it's that, and for that reason, it matters intently. See, Jerusalem was going to be filled with people on a pilgrimage from all over the place. Josephus was a a historian of the early church, uh, and he kind of talked about the church from a distance. He he talked about what he observed and what he saw happening in and around the church, and and he often talked about these feasts gathering millions of people together. So the talk of Jesus is electric, right? The talk of Jesus is, is literally like waves moving through these crowds of people that are gathering. And, and we look at chapter 11, verse 55, we continue on, and it, it says this. It, it says, now the, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. And they were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think 
that, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now that the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might go and arrest him. Do you see the tension? Do you see kind of what's taking place? Lazarus was just raised from the dead, a miracle among miracles, and, and a major festival is about to get underway in just a week. Hundreds upon thousands of people are pouring in Jerusalem with every passing moment. The talk about Jesus is like a wildfire through the crowds. And the religious leaders in that moment are extremely nervous. Extremely nervous. Ner so nervous that they're willing to do anything to keep their power. And here's the thing. Jesus is no longer hiding. Jesus is fully announced what he's about. He's about to enter Jerusalem, and it's approaching the last week of his life, and he's going to do some incredible, incredible things. So this is the setting, right? This, this gives you the setting of when Jesus enters, right, and comes into this, this moment. And we often call it the, the triumphal entry. It's uh, referred to as Palm Sunday, and it's an important moment in the life of Jesus. It's more than just a story that we, that we get to partake in. It's more than a cute thing that kids do with, with palm fronds on a, on a Sunday every year before Easter. It, it shows us something critical. It, it, it shows the, the part of Jesus' path to the cross and what's about to take place. It, it tells us about him, but it also, it also illustrates some stuff about us. For all the fanfare, for all the cheering, right? for all the enthusiasm that, that the, this entry, this triumphant entry of Jesus is is really going to reveal something tragic to us. It's going to show us just how different Jesus' agenda is from ours or from the agenda of the people that he showed up to rescue. It's going to show us just how easy it is to cheer for a king who is giving us everything we want and then how quickly we can turn off that support, that devotion, when we're not getting what we want. Guys, the triumphal, triumphal entry, is, it's a warning for us. It's a warning for us to, to be, beware of following Jesus with our agenda because that's not how Jesus gets followed according to the Bible. So I want to look at what people were thinking because I think that's where we start to see bits and pieces of ourselves in this story. I want us to be able to look at this and I want us to be able to, to, to identify the parts of who we are in some of these other people so we can be better followers of Jesus right now. Now if you look at, at, at John chapter 12 verse 12, we can identify the time frame and what's happening. It was likely a Tuesday, four days before Jesus was going to be crucified and five before the Passover. When Jesus made his entrance into Jerusalem, this is what was taking place. That the crowd heard that Jesus was making his way there, and so the anticipation, the excitement was being whipped up. Not, not because anything Jesus is, is particularly doing or, or, or disciples or followers of him are doing, it's just the miracle was speaking for itself. So there were three groups of people that were gathered in that moment, right? And we get a sense of what each is thinking as we read the scriptures surrounding that. So the first thing I want to look at is the crowd. And I want us to understand what it is that they were going through, what it was they were thinking about, and the things that were going on in their heart and in their life. And we're going to do that by looking at John 12, uh, verse 12. It says this, the, the next day, the large crowd had come to the feast. They heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, so they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him. We see what they're up to. We get some, some basics, but then they said they were crying out something. It says they were crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. This moment is exploding with symbolism and meaning. Guys, in that day, that, this was not uncommon. This, this wasn't something that, was, that only happened to Jesus, but when it happens to Jesus, it says so much more. Military rulers, conquerors of that day, warriors would go out for Rome. And when they entered a city, they would, they, would, they would wage war on behalf of the city. And if they were victorious, victorious on foreign soil, if they killed a certain number of, of enemy, right? Or they gained, uh, maybe they gained a new territory for Rome. Well, when they came back home, Rome would throw them this triumphant entry, entry back into their city. And when they would do that, they would hold, hold palm branches and, because the palm branch was a, a national symbol of victory for Israel. They, this would symbolize national pride, it would it symbolize liberation, and it would symbolize victory. And, and here they're quoting Psalm 118, which is a psalm of victory over enemies. And they're saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Guys, this was a prayer that God would fight for his people and fight for them again and again. And the, the crowd's expectation in this moment 
is that Jesus is, is going to be some kind of a national deliverer, almost a political figure that would, would come wield their power on their behalf. And so the crowds thought that, that finally, finally relief is on the way. Finally somebody who's come, they've heard about our impression, they, they understand what Rome is doing to us, and they're going to alleviate all of these awful things. They hear about the resurrection of Lazarus. Lazarus and 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 so they see and hear stories, firsthand account of people who heard about Lazarus Lazarus being raised from the dead because they continued to testify about it. The masses were gathering, right, to see this powerful teacher who they believed would rescue them from oppression and the occupying forces of Rome. They were hungry for change. They wanted help. You know, they wanted wanted this this rescue so bad, but they're not going to get the kind of rescue they thought. Jesus came with a different kind of rescue in mind. A few days later, the, the, the culture of the city would change dramatically. The crowds would mock Jesus instead of herald him, right? They would, they would cry out, crucify him instead of welcome him. And once they realized Jesus wasn't going to give the very thing that they wanted, well, he became useless to them. And they began to treat him that way. And what they ended up doing was they did the worst. They chose a murderer, right, named Barabbas over their savior, Jesus. You get a real good picture of what the crowds were thinking in that time. But now that we got to look at another group of people, the disciples. In John 12, verses 14 through 16, it tells us Jesus enters the city on a donkey, fulfilling a prophecy that was to be, uh, that was fulfilled from Zechariah 9, 9, that the coming king would be a man of peace since a, a donkey would be his, his mode of transportation. The donkey was a, was a humble animal and it was associated with humility. And this is what it says in, in those verses. We look at it again. It says, Jesus found the young donkey, sat on it, just as it was written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. As his disciples didn't understand these things at first. Every time I read this, and, and I've read it several times for you already, it, it just brings me a little comfort because there's so much about the scriptures that I don't get at first. And sometimes it just takes consistently going back again and again. It takes prayer. It takes devotion for these things to kind of sit in my heart for the, until, the, until the point that I understand them. And, and I, it, it makes me feel good to know that these guys who walked hand in hand, right, arm in arm, and, and you literally along the same dusty paths, even with Jesus himself, didn't get it at first. And then it says, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. They simply just missed it. They missed everything that was happening in front of them. Luke 19 records that the disciples were saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. No doubt that these guys had thought Jesus was bringing in the long-awaited kingdom of God. They knew that, and they were going to be a prominent part of it. At least that's what they figured, right? They were going to be set up as, well, maybe many kings, many gods. Certainly those who'd be recognized as people with authority because of how they had sacrificed to follow this rescuer. The disciples frequently wrestled with these kinds of things, these thoughts, right, of, especially as it related to Jesus' kingdom and how they were going to fit in. We know from Luke chapter 22, which is a great place to read this week to, to see some of this wrestling that was taking place. Uh, we know from Luke 22 that a few days after the, the triumphant entry of Jesus uh, into Jerusalem, the disciples argued about this very thing. Who was going to be the greatest in his kingdom? They missed the entire purpose of the entry of Jesus in the way that he did what he did. They missed the effect. And and here's the thing. All of it was devastating. It was devastating to them, and it was devastating to Jesus. As Peter completely misunderstands Jesus' mission, and at the arrest of Jesus, he goes off and attacks the high priest's servant by cutting off his ear. Matthew 27 tells us that at the arrest of Jesus... All of his disciples, every single one of them fled. They all left him. They abandoned him in that time. Peter goes on, fulfills a prophecy that was told about him in Matthew 27, and he denies Jesus not once or twice, but he denies Jesus three times. The disciples thought something very specific. They thought Jesus was going to come, usher in this new kingdom, and that they were going to become men of power because of it. And then when this doesn't materialize, when they start to realize this is not what's going to happen at all, that call of blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord turns really quickly into, I don't even know the guy. Jesus who? Who are you talking about? 
Guys, when Jesus couldn't give the disciples what they wanted, they dropped him. They dropped him immediately. They turned and they ran, denied his, even his existence in the moment. So that's not the only one. We also have the religious leaders of the day. And so I want to look at the religious leaders in this time too. This, this group uh, is, is an interesting group. Of all the people who should have known, these guys should have known. You know, wh- what, what do these guys want? I think that's a great question. They, what I think they wanted is they wanted to retain power. They wanted to retain prominence. They wanted, they wanted, they wanted anything that was threatening that to be taken care of. And so this is what we see in John 12, 19. It says, the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Remember the earlier passage that we read in, in John 11. It says, if we let him go on like this, everyone's going to believe him. And the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. See, Caiaphas, the high priest, he even suggests it would be better for him to, to die than the entire nation should perish. This is, this is how we get the glimpse into their heart, right? The religious leaders were afraid that Jesus was going to destroy the nation that was around them. And I'm convinced that if they believed that, that, that they were somehow in the midst of all this doing the work of God. They, they had to save Israel from Jesus. I mean, and, and how tragic and ironic is that thought process? The religious leaders, right? The thought leaders of the day, they thought they were doing the work of God, but instead they were destroying the work of God because they were wrapped up in their own power. They were wrapped up in their their sense of control. Guys, in reality, as you study this word, as you look at these things, what you begin to see is they were doing the, the, the work of the enemy. And in doing so, they ultimately killed the Son of God. The tragedy of the the triumphal entry is just how off the chanting crowds, devoted disciples, and religious rulers really were. And the danger is for us to point a finger and say, how did they miss it? Right? The appropriate thing for us to do is to look at this moment and to examine, how am I missing it now? How do I miss Jesus for all that he is Guys, the common link between all of these groups was they all wanted something from Jesus. And they were all telling him what it was. The crowds wanted relief. They wanted that political leader. The disciples wanted honor, prestige. The religious leaders wanted security and power. When Jesus threatened all of those things, they didn't try to figure out how to follow Jesus. Instead, everything changed. Right? The, the crowds discarded him. The disciples had turned their back and abandoned him. And the religious leaders, they murdered him. All because Jesus threatened what they wanted. So there's some cautions here. Right? What do you want from Jesus? What is it that you're asking of Jesus today? What's your agenda as you approach him? Do you think that you'd be any different from the crowds? Do you think that you'd be any different than the disciples or the religious leaders? Guys, I don't know how much we would be today. I don't know how much I would be. But I, and, and, and the reason I say that is I, I look at these things, and here's some things I learned about myself as I thought about this section of Scripture. And the first thing is, is, is being aware of being overconfident. Because every one of them was wanting something, and I know I want something too. And so I've got to be careful that I'm not overconfident, that my heart is not overconfident. Because as I read this, I'm struck with this, this crass overconfidence of the disciples who think somehow because they know Jesus and they're a part of his plan and they're working with him, that they understand his heart and he understands their heart. But the, the real story is that they don't know either. They don't get any of it, right? The, the, the Bible frequently reminds us of, of the dangerousness of being fickle and the fickleness of the human heart and how quickly we're on one minute and then off again the next, It's good to remember our tendency to wander, and I think this reminds us of how easy it is for us to just turn away and walk away. Guys, it reminds me that that peer pressure is not just a teenage thing. Guys, this peer pressure is a human issue. And, and, And just because we get older doesn't mean that we're still not succumbing to it. Crowds can convince us. They can convince us to believe things that we don't for good or bad. A bad, a bad crowd can cause you to say and do things that you would never otherwise do because they completely violate who you claim to be. A, a good crowd can make you feel like you are just like them when you're not at all like them. And it's a wonderful gift, guys, to, to, to be raised up in a Christian home with all the great teachings of Jesus. 
But, but even though you're in a great home with a good influence, don't assume that because you're in a Christian crowd that you're a follower of Jesus. This is a personal choice. Don't become overconfident in your heart by the goodness of the crowd that you're around. Make the right choice and choose personally to follow Jesus today and be aware, right? Be aware of what's going on around you because if you're not, you've got to be aware of the belief in a crowd. It's a very dangerous thing. Third thing is, is this, beware of making Jesus your lackey. Beware of making Jesus somehow your servant. Had the crowd, the, the, dis- the disciples, and, and even the Pharisees all wanted something from Jesus. And, and they all missed him, right? This is what happens when you view Jesus as your personal servant. When you come to Jesus because of secondary needs, like, like uh, uh, needing a restored marriage, or you want your kids to, to be more obedient, or you want some internal happiness that you've been lacking, a better job, you, you want somehow your finances to get fixed, or you, you need your spouse to change, or you're, you're praying for a drug-free life. Guys, it's too easy in those moments to to, to be focused on the wrong thing. All of those things can be fixed by Jesus for sure. Absolutely, without hesitation. But those are the fruit of surrender. Those things are the fruit of surrendering to Jesus. So beware of coming to Jesus like the rich young ruler does because of what you want from him. Go look at Luke 18 this week. Read verses 18 through 30. Dig into what's there, because I think what it does is it reveals to us just how quickly we can go down the wrong path. Fourth thing is this, beware of confusing your agenda with God's agenda. There was something that the disciples had in common with the religious leaders. Both confused their agenda with God's agenda. The disciples are are convinced that that Jesus is bringing in the kingdom. The religious leaders thought that that Jesus was out to destroy the kingdom, so the, the disciples squabble about who is the greatest. And Peter cuts off the the priest's ear. So the religious leaders determined to kill Jesus. It's a dangerous thing when you believe somehow that your agenda is God's agenda. And I want us to be sure that we know the word of God above all things. Be sure that we know what God says in every situation. Let us be sure that we continually order our lives in light of the word and not in personal choices or preferences. We need to be careful in our judgment of other people. We have to be cautious in determining God's will. And we've got to be reminded that God doesn't need our help to fight his battles. He is working out his good and perfect and just will right before our eyes on a daily basis, and he will continue to do so. So let's be willing to see it. Let's be willing to accept that work. The fifth point is this. Beware of religion without relationship. As I read the Bible, in particular the Gospels, I'm shocked over and over by the fact that the people who were Jesus' greatest challenge were supposed to be the ones who were going to get it. They were going to understand it. But instead, they miss it. They schemed, they plotted, they bribed, they lied, they manipulated. And in the end, ultimately, they murdered the Son of God. And they did it all under this banner of being religious. Guys, Take the warning. Take the warning. Take the the danger signs of of religion without relationship. Guys, Judaism was supposedly about the one true God and loving him with all your heart, your soul, and your might. But somehow, as often happens, it became about the form. So I want to remind you that Christianity makes zero sense without Jesus. Without knowing Jesus, all of this is empty religion. So let's be sure that we know who Jesus is. Or it won't be long until we become 21st century Pharisees, justifying our sinful hearts with religious language. So what do you want from Jesus? What are you looking for from, from Jesus today? Are you looking for power? Are you looking for security? The triumphant entry reminds us that Jesus doesn't always give us what we want. Thank God for that truth. Thank God we don't always get what we want. It's also going to remind us of this too, though. It's also going to remind us that Jesus came to change what we want. And maybe God is changing you today. Here's how he does that. He does it through the cross. 
The cross accomplishes this work. It's accomplished it in my life. It's accomplished it in so many others, and it can accomplish that in you today. Let the cross of Jesus speak exactly what it was intended to speak for so long. Transformation, change, hope, life, abundant life, eternal life can be yours today. Don't don't turn this stream off. Don't, Don't disengage until you have said what you need to say to Jesus. For some of you, it's, it's a simple yes, God. Yes, today is my yes. Today I choose to follow. Today I will, I will abandon my sin. Today I will turn away from the life that I've lived and I will embrace what you have for me. It's the most powerful and important thing that you can do. There's nothing greater. There's no more important message. There's, no, there's nothing that you could put on your calendar that's, that's greater than doing this. And so I want to encourage you, if you need to do that today, do that right now. And it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter who you're watching with. Your family would be supportive of it, I guarantee you. And, and you'll have a, a church full of people eager to welcome you back one day. We will do that right now in this moment. If you click that, if you make that, if you make that decision and you put it in the comments, I promise you, you will see the church react the way the church is supposed to react. Just as the the heavens explode in excitement for one, we will do the same for you. We would do the same for you. And it could be that you're here listening to this message today. Maybe Maybe you've had Jesus in your life, but maybe it's been on your terms. And it's time to surrender. I want to offer that same opportunity to you. Tell God, I surrender. Right? I see what you came to do. I see it more clearly now than I've ever seen it before. And here's the thing. I need your forgiveness because I've made this whole thing about me. I don't want it to be about me anymore. I need it to be about you because it's always been about you. It's always been about your kingdom. It's always been about your work. Forgive me and then, and then, then give me my mission. Give me, point me in the right direction so that I can go and help other people see the truth. Father, we are so thankful to have had this opportunity to worship, to, to gather and to study your word, to take a, a, a few moments where we can come together and do this work. And so what I do is I ask and I pray for this, uh, that you would empower us in these last moments that the songs that we sing as we close our service together are more than just something to to, to put at the end of a service, but they're a a response, our our rallying cry. There are heartbreak expressed. There are sorrow over sin. There are apology for walking the wrong way and choosing anything over you. Well, maybe they're the banner of of victory over sin that we've conquered in in you over these last few weeks. Maybe you had relief and victory over fear. Then sing. It could be that that there was doubt or, or things in your life before this moment. Well, then sing and make this your banner's cry. Like, call it out. Enjoy this moment. Lift up this time because Jesus is worthy. He is worthy of all of it, every single bit. We thank you. We pray for these things and we pray them in Jesus' name. And we do that together in this place. Amen.
Thank you. 